All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here today, Dan. Um, I'm excited to talk about the three years of winter squash that we've been testing at USU. Um, I'm our urban and small farm specialist, but I'm also um, an avid urban homesteader. And so winter squash are a key part of the homestead as well. And so the research is near and dear to my heart. Um, so this is a collaboration with uh, a number of other states. You, you'll see that we're really uh, representing out here in Utah in the West. Most of the states are based out East. Um, and the University of Tennessee is, is who coordinated this whole study. So not all of the states participated every year with us, um, but a lot of states did. And so we, our goal was really to look at um, different crops of winter squash each year, understand um, cultivar differences with yield and marketability and storability um, across the different states. And so today I'm really just gonna talk about what happened here in Utah. Um, and the three different types of winter squash that we trialed. So 10 cultivars was considered manageable across the states is enough that we can grow in one year. Um, and then in addition to uh, what we're, we were studying as a group across the states here at Utah State, we also added um, a BRICS measurement over time and dry matter. So BRICS is a measurement um, that kind of gets at the sugar content or how sweet the squash is. So with that, um, this research started in 2020. Uh, the first year we looked at kabocha type squash. Um, it's a smaller squash, so it's, it's easier to store, um, don't need as much space. There's less research on kabocha, but they're really starting to gain some culinary popularity. They're a lower water content squash, um, and they can be a sweeter squash as well. And there's just a lot of variability too with the different cultivars. Now, in 2021, we refer to this year as the C maxima year. Um, it, it, that's kind of a, a casual way to re refer to it, but these were kind of large and beautiful pumpkin type um, squash. And so that's a really loose term to use, but I'll show some of the cultivars to kind of highlight what we meant by that. Um, there's a lot of diversity and a decorative ability, and, and then also curious about the culinary aspects of it. And then lastly, this year we went uh, to acorn squash, a lot of cultivars here, and um, they're one of those early maturing uh, winter squash. So these are what we studied each year. Um, and I want to just highlight, there's a couple sources out there that look at the curing time for winter squash and the optimal eating period. Personally, I kind of I kind of cringe when I hear of people getting all excited to eat their butternuts in September. Oh, because a lot of these squash, depending on the type, they actually they'll taste better over time by having that that period in storage. And that they can, when you're thinking of a homestead or other um, food banks trying to have a nutritious local vegetable um, option, it's interesting to see how long you can really expect out of some of these squash through um, through storage. So. In our study this last year, we looked at acorn. This is a nice squash because it's pretty much ready. It's at its culinary peak right out of the field. So it's a, a great one right away. Um, there's different types of kabocha. We did include some mini kabocha in our study. Um, and so you can see when they uh, peak for their culinary appeal. And then there's other kabochas that are actually um, longer term stores and so forth. Um, and then here's some specialty pumpkins. So another way to look at that uh, in terms of the, the peak culinary quality, this is out of Oregon State um, and looking at kind of this monthly window. So I'm going to go into our study of all these years. I have so much I want to share with you. It's going to be a little bit like information through a fire hose, but all of these slides will be available as will be the recording. So um, again, here are the ones that some of the ones that we looked at. So the Utah State Study Site, um, ooh, here we are. Uh, we are up here in North Logan, so the northern part of the state. It's kind of a zone five-ish. Those of you who are out of state, um, our last frost is around mid-May, maybe a little bit later. And so we're in this high elevation climate. Um, soil is about 2% organic matter. Here's our field site. We ran, we, we grew squash here at this field site for three years in a row. Um, our our first frost is really variable though. It's pretty much all bets are off after Labor Day essentially, but typically it happens around October, beginning of October, late September. So that's that's the length of our growing season. 
um, for producing these. Some of our general trial practices across the years. So we used a conventional system. We tilled. Here's an amazing pile of bindweed coming out of the field from tillage. Uh, we use drip, drip irrigation, black plastic mulch. That really helps us here in Utah um, with maturity in that it gets really hot during the day, but it really cools off at night as well. And so that helps us along to have mature crop by the um, by first frost. And then we use soil testing um, to determine our phosphorus and potassium needs. Appli our, our nitrogen applications varied by the type of squash we were growing. So when we were growing the large pumpkin types, we were at around 150 pounds of N per acre equivalent, where it was around 120 for the acorns and, and the kabocha. Um, and then I wanna just also highlight, we get questions about this a lot of when is the best time to harvest? How do you know when a winter squash is ready to go? And so I wanna, um, there's a fingernail test. So if you try to scrape the skin gently, it shouldn't peel off if it's ready to go. Um, a really nice way to look at it is if the stem is corky. So I've got two pictures here. Um, one is of a mashed potato acorn squash and you can see how it's green. Whereas here's a picture of a kabocha um, and it's kind of got that woody look or corky look to it. That's a really nice way to tell if it's ready. So this acorn was, was harvested um, a little too early. Uh, and so, so that was when we knew to harvest. We also tried to leave them as long as possible. Um, but if we saw that there was danger of a hard frost, we made sure to have them harvested right away. So um, one harvest per year, you'll see that the different cultivars matured at different times, but we harvested them all at once. And then for just field management during the year, we weeded as needed. Um, irrigation depended on environmental conditions, um, but we used the soil sensor to determine um, how wet the soil was and what kind of water was needed. And um, we applied our nitrogen applications through fertigation. So splitting that into six to eight applications throughout the year. And then we had, in some years, we had some really strong wind storms and we also have uh, some very friendly deer. And so we, we conducted plant counts um, just because that affects the total yield and thinking about production for plants um, based on ones that may have been missing. So our harvests were in each October. And these are some of the things that we recorded for each year. Um, we were looking at the number of marketable squash produced per plot, um, and then we could further get that to per plant. Marketable means something that you would eat. It hasn't been sunburned or rotted or anything like that. Um, and then we, we measured the weight, the length and width, so the size of each squash. Um, and uh, it, it, I said, except for mini. So we've got a really, really tiny kabocha type that can be really very, very productive. Um, and so for that, we just did an average of the first 20. But otherwise we put at least 10 squash per variety into long-term storage. And I just wanna point out that um, winter squash are best stored at warmer temperatures. So when we think about root cellars and typical things that go into storage like onions and potatoes that need it quite cold, um, by contrast, winter squash like it a bit warmer. So in the 50 to 60 degree range and also moist conditions around 50 to 70% humidity is considered ideal. Um, so here we are as an example of just, uh, this is our kabocha trial in the first year and going through and collecting the squash and tracing vines back. Um, in storage then, we measured the weight uh, monthly. We looked at the water content or dry matter and then that, that measurement of sugar content as well. Um, so we took different soil, or not soil cores, excuse me, um, fruit cores and brought that back here uh, to the lab. And um, when the squash became kind of gross or before they became kind of gross, they, that was when it was time to toss them and say, all right, they're not worth, or they're not gonna last past this point. Um, so our spoiler alert here is that our C. maxima trial, the, the big pumpkin trial, it got kind of gross by February. <laughs> so those are a more short-term storage prop. Anyway, so first year was kabocha. This was during COVID. We got the seeds late, so it ended up going in towards the end of June. Um, but here's just a, a schematic of our field, eight rows of squash. Um, the rows are 100 feet long. And so we randomized the 10 different cultivars um, across the field. But um, let's see here. So we had um, four replications of each or four plots of each cultivar, and there were six plants per um, cultivar, so a total of 24 plants per cultivar. Here are the cultivars, a really quick shot. 
look at them. Um, so you can see that there's a few orange ones. There's a green and orange one, speckled pup. Otherwise, there's green and gray. And um, in thinking about how long they store and their peak culinary quality, those gray winter squash, like winter sweet, for example, those are the type that are considered the longest type for storage. Um, here's a little bit on the industry descriptions of the different varieties. You can see their maturity, the, the length of time it takes predicted weight and just a little description. So I'll come back to this and compare it to um, what we found in our study. The only one that's real different to point out is this uh, Shokichi green. This was our mini, um, our small type. So, all right, going right into results. All of the results are gonna look this way where I've got the 10 different cultivars on the bottom of the graph. Each bar is a cultivar. Here is the weight per squash. So we measured each fruit and this is the average um, weight of it. And you can see there's a lot of variability, um, but Geisha was our largest. And here's our little Shokichi green. I've got a picture of it here where it can fit in the palm of your hand. Nice single serving type squash. Um, and But they, they very much can range. And then in counting the number of squash per plant. Um, so there's always this trade-off between the size of each squash and how much the plant can produce. So the smaller size, you can generally have of greater number of fruit per plant. Um, and then if we put that information together and look at the production per plant in pounds, so the average size of the fruit times the number of fruit, this is kind of looking at the productivity by different cultivars. So Geisha and Golden Butterball um, had some of the greatest productivity and Speckled Pup is right up there as well. Whereas some of the others like Winter Sweet and Amber Max um, had, had lower productivity. More on that coming up. But in looking at um, their storage potential, so putting them into storage in October, we measured them, their weight over time. And you can kind of look at this as, so this is the percentage of original weight. So um, how quickly they're losing weight is kind of an indication of, of how well they'll store over time. And so these, these top three, I want to point out that really didn't lose a lot of weight over time. Uh, Amber Max, Speckled Pup, and Sweet Mama really hung in there through March. And that's that's interesting to look at is in thinking about, all right, I want to eat winter squash all winter. Which ones are going to last towards the end of winter? These may be some options, whereas others really dropped off. Um, so Delica, Shokichi Green did to some extent, um, and, and so forth. So these guys really dropped off. So eating around January was kind of ideal for a lot of the kabocha. Um, looking at bricks, that indicator of sweetness, I've got the percent bricks here, and I'm just showing it for two months, uh, January and February, and so you can see that it tends to drop off on some of them um, as we get into February, kind of getting to the end of their storage life, um, but other ones are able to hang on. But I also want to point out, if we think back to some of those uh, kabochas that were particularly productive, Geisha, Golden Butterball, uh, Speckled Pup, take a look at what their sugar content is. Now, some of this um, is up to individual tastes. I personally like a sweeter squash. I don't have to add as much sugar with baking. It just has a lot. It's not the only thing that goes into flavor, um, but it's a large part of it. So some of these that have been really productive had, had lower brixes and in my opinion, didn't taste quite as good as, as some of these others like winter sweet that had a naturally higher um, sugar content. Same with Shokichi green here. Um, but this is also... You could look at this as an indicator as well of storage life and just some of these are really dropping off by February. So if we put that whole year uh, worth of data into a table, this is um, the left side of the table is what I first showed on the industry description or commercial description. And then here's some of the data here at USU. And again, I'll make these slides available so that the numbers are available, but in summarizing just the size of the squash, um, by weight and uh, diameter, as well as the number per plant, the yield, um, percent moisture, and bricks. So I want to just quick say with kabocha, it's considered a relatively dry squash, and that was definitely true. On average, it was around 78% moisture, um, which would be 22% dry matter. And, and so that's a relative, you'll see in the next, um, the next crop just how dry that is. And with bricks, I want to point out that our range was from 8 to 13%. This is when it was at its culinary peak. And so there's a few of these, this 12 and 13, that's a noticeable difference 
um, in sugar content. So moving on to 2021 in our C maxima study. Uh, so looking at those colorful pumpkins, uh, decorative types. Again, same kind of plot plan, same field. The rows were a little bit longer, same number of plots. Again, six plants per plot, four plots per cultivar. And these are the names of the different cultivars, uh, porcelain dowel, jardale, those are really popular ones, fairy tale, um, popular ones that are out there. And so a little bit on the spacings. And so here we sowed on time this year. So early June, gave the soil some time to warm up a bit. Um, and then we were harvested by October 10th. So here is um, some pictures of these different cultivars. And uh, so we had a white pumpkin. Most of these are kind of a light greenish color. Uh, Marina di Shiogia has a really nice bumpy, uh, interesting outside in a dark green color. Now, fairy tale, I've got some pictures of this coming up. This is actually fairy tale in March at my house. A lot of times when you harvest this squash, it's, it's a dark green color and it takes a lot of time in storage to hit this beautiful copper color that gets advertised a lot. Um, porcelain dolls are only pink one. And so here's a bit from the commercial descriptions about what to expect. So here we've got this much longer um, number of days to maturity, over 100. Look at this fairy tale, 125. That can be a lot. Um, and then also just the size of these things too, up to 30 pounds for each fruit um, is pretty significant um, to think about all of that production in a year. So we, um, a little bit, I wanted to show our field. It's the same field we used every year and we really pushed the limits of space in 2021 because these were huge, huge plants producing large fruit. And so we absolutely ran out of space um, with our study design. I think if there was one thing we could do differently, it would be to have a larger field for this trial because trying to trace the vines later was, was no easy feat. Um, but anyway, so we grew the, the C maxima in 2021 and I'll share the results. So the first thing I wanna point out is again, the weight per squash and the size of these things where the average weight for example, with fairy tale, is almost 30 pounds uh, per fruit. It was a true workout in the field when we were harvesting these. Um, but really, all of these are, are relatively heavy. And so I, I put this picture of um, one of the, I think this was the Marina di Chiogia um, here that I was cutting open. And it's a nice representative of these different C maxima because I think um, a lot of us are familiar with pie pumpkins. When you open when you or uh, ones that you may use for jack o' lanterns, and when you cut open those types of pumpkins, um, the seed cavity is quite large, and so they weigh really not too much um, considering their size. But when we get into these types, um, just look at all that meat in this relative to the size of the seed cavity. A lot smaller seed cavity relative to all this meat, and so that's where that weight is coming from. Not to mention its size as well. But anyway. Um, so then looking at the number of marketable squash produced per plant as well, again, there's a trade-off between a really large size and the number of fruit that a plant could produce. Um, so speckled hound was one of our lighter ones and it was able to produce more fruit and so forth. Um, putting those data together, uh, the, the average amount of marketable yield per plant in pounds just amazing productivity. Fairy tale is nearly a hundred pounds. Had to go over those data a few times to really believe it. But then I remembered our field day um, in harvesting <laughs> how much work it was. And I definitely uh, can back that up. So um, a lot of production can happen from C maxima if you have this space. And just thinking about having this nutri uh, nutritionally dense local vegetable for food banks or for homesteading or anything like that throughout winter is it's really impressive what these squash can do. So looking at their weight loss and storage over time. Now this trial, it was over in February officially. Things, um, things just got bad by February. Um, but you can see that overall, they're keeping most of their weight. One of the challenges that we had in storage is just the sheer size of these squash and having enough space to store them all without stacking. So stacking really is gonna reduce the storage life of winter squash, especially heavy ones. And that's absolutely what happened. 
Um, to point out, Jaredale is this yellow line here at the top, and that one really held its own. I, this is actually a picture on my um, kitchen table in February. It still tasted delicious. Um, I had kept some at home that I stored. So as long as you're not stacking too much, you could actually extend the life of some of these longer. It's just that they're so heavy and they can crush under their own weight. Here's fairy tale that dropped off pretty significantly. Um, but again, part of that was the storage conditions and just like the sheer size, the weight of those um, can be hard to keep up. So, but overall they stuck in and uh, they stuck in pretty well. Um, if you have the right storage conditions, they can probably last longer. Looking at their BRICS readings, um, I wanted to put the error bars on here because it was highly, highly variable um, based on how well the different C maxima were keeping. But I've got the BRICS readings from November through February. Um, and so you can see we're really right around this eight, nine percent. And if you remember back to the kabochas, those were between, I think it was eight and 13%. So it's not, none of these were as sweet as the highest um, BRICS kabocha. And that's one thing to kind of keep in mind and, um, and take a look at. So triangle, there's a picture of triangle, triangle down here on the right corner. It kind of has a punky look to it. Um, very ribbed and irregular shaped. That one has one of the highest BRICS counts. All right, and so a quick trial summary here. Um, massive crop, lower bricks, very high moisture content. That's something I don't really care for in baking um, when I'm when I'm sorry, when I'm um, cooking these and I'm gonna use them for baking. Uh, if you don't use them right away, a lot of that water can drop off and I don't really care for that as much like I like uh, kabocha, um, but they certainly can, there's range here. Um, they can also be very delicious. So lastly, our acorn squash trial, again, same field design, um, a bit smaller plants, 10 cultivars again, uh, 24 plants per cultivar, similar sowing and harvest time to the C maxima. Um, here is a picture of the different cultivars that we trialed. You can see that seven of them all look very similar. They're all a dark green color. Um, and then we had a couple colorful varieties with Celebration, Heart of Gold, and then mashed potato, which is an all white variety. Some industry dis, uh, descriptions, you can see it's a smaller type squash. So acorns are between one and three pounds. Getting right into results, um, the weight per squash, we had some really, really nice sized ones actually in our trial um, that you can see here. And here's some pictures of them. Also looking at the number of marketable squash per plant. Now, um, there's always, I, I really believe that there's this trade-off between how much a plant can produce. And, and here you can see mashed potato is defying the odds. It's very productive in terms of how heavy it is, as well as how many are produced per plant. But there is a trade-off that I'll show in the next couple of slides here. Um, but yeah, uh, another great year of squash. If we look at the marketable yield per plant, so putting together the number of squash per plant and the pounds um, of total production, then you can see that mashed potato really stands out from the rest in terms of productivity, um, followed by Royal Ace and Table Ace. And I'll take here's a here's a look at what they look like if you were to cut them open and thinking about the size of the seed cavity relative to the amount of meat that's in there. Can kind of see why mashed potato um, weighs so much in that it has has a smaller seed cavity, a lot of meat around it, and a larger size to it too. So the results, the weight loss in storage percent of original weight we're looking at from October um, into January. Now remember, acorn squash are the type that are uh, edible right out of the field. They're at their culinary peak and they're rated for about three months. And so. Um, that's what we looked at here in the trial. And you can see there's a big drop off that happens between that October harvest date and getting into November here. Um, there's a drop off, which means they're losing their storability relatively quickly with mashed potato um, here at the bottom. Now, I'm going to skip actually and show you guys. Mashed potato, I like to pick on a little bit. Here's the bricks count in October and December I'm showing. And it's, it's set apart from the other acorn squash in its low bricks content. Uh, and um, truly it just, it's not a, I love what they named it, mashed potato. It's a very bland squash. And so that kind of 
um, tell someone they may want to put toppings on it or whatever else, but it's flavor by itself is not, I didn't find it to be good. And I, I think a few others felt that too. So it's a very productive squash. It didn't hold up well in, um, in storage and it also has a very low bricks. So I think it's great for a decoration, a nice basket of white squash. Uh, looks really nice in the fall, but in terms of culinary appeal, very low. Storability, very low. Um, celebration and uh, autumn perfection were really good. Um, so, so were some of these dark green varieties like autumn perfection and um, heart of gold. So those ones came in really high and they held their own even into January. Again, getting back to the bricks where they're all, so kabocha maxed out at 13%. These are around 12%. So these can be very sweet like kabocha as well, sweeter than the C maxima. So some varieties are a little bit lower. Um, seeing that there wasn't much change, there's a lot of variability in this, but they were sweeter in October than December. So that kind of gets that fresh eating right out of the field is a good way to go um, for acorn squash. So to summarize this last year, um, in looking at the size of the squash, um, as well as the moisture content and the bricks, they are a moister squash than kabocha. So they're kind of similar um, along the same level as the, some of the C maxima. And then the bricks content varied with mashed potato being the least sweet, um, but others approaching the kabochas, like table and autumn perfection were up there as well as celebration. Um, and I thought those were better tasting since that's my personal palate. So to summarize the three years, kabocha are a lower moisture squash. They have a velvety texture. I didn't talk about this so much, um, but a lot of pie pumpkins and other things, they have more of a stringy texture that you really have to kind of beat um, to mash up well. But this had a naturally velvety texture, high bricks, the highest bricks that we had and long storage. So for me, it was a winner with cooking and baking. Um, for eating the seeds though, they have really thick hulls so that uh, it can be a lot of work to de-hull them. And I also found that they can be more sensitive to environmental conditions and extremes like temperature extremes and so forth. So here's a picture of my dad. He's also a squash lover and always, always went for pie pumpkins. But after trying the kabocha, he's a convert. Um, here we are making a, a showstopper. Uh, so C maxima, they're beautiful and diverse. They need a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to store. For me, I think they're better for decorative because of how much uh, I like the kabocha. And then finally, the acorn are amazing um, to eat right out of the field. And when I'm planting, I really like to think about eating throughout the year. So I like having acorn as something ready right away. And then kabocha is what I'd move into later in the winter. They also have seeds that are a lot like pie pumpkins. Uh, so not a very thick hull, and they made the most delicious seeds for eating. Nutty flavor, a lot of complexity, really, really good. So with that, um, thank you. And I maybe we'll have time for a question or two and can stay around. Yeah, Melanie, that's wonderful. That was beautiful news. Um, I got two questions for you. Um, what would you consider the best situation for long-term storage? Mm, great question. Um, so first of all, I would say the temperature and the getting the temperature right. Um, I made that mistake early on in, in homesteading a few years ago that I was putting them in a root cellar with my other storage crops, but they really need it warmer. So picking a cooler closet in the house or a spare room is a lot better than a basement type situation. So keeping it around mid fifties is ideal for temperature. And if you can have a higher humidity in that area, that helps too. And I think it kind of goes back to um, how high of a water content these really are. So those would be the best. And then also not stacking. Some of the smaller types you can, and it's no problem, acorn, the small kabocha, but the large types, try not to stack it and have a shelf situation. Okay. And then a second question was, um, did you treat the squash with anything um, for storage? You know, we didn't. And I've, I've heard of people doing a weak bleach solution and wiping down squash before putting them in storage. We didn't do that. We did try to select ones. Um, you know, when we were counting marketability and looking through that, we did try to select, well, we, we purposefully selected ones that were marketable, that weren't sunburned, that we're going to keep during storage, um, made sure that they had their, their stems, that those weren't broken off, that can reduce st storage. But we personally didn't treat them for anything, but I've heard of people who have. 